uh, MWPAC, and uh, this is this is one of the best services that MWPAC does every year. Is to help candidates, male, and female, to uh, learn how to do your best in going out there and uh, um, taking this this big leap to run as a candidate. So I want to thank everybody for coming, uh, candidates and all, all of their supporters, and anybody interested in running as a candidate at some point, maybe. And then also to all of our speakers. So um, just to be brief, uh, does everybody have a, um, a program? Okay. So we'll just uh, hopefully follow the program and just keep it rolling so everybody can leave at a, at a decent time. I uh, just want to let you know about some of our upcoming events that we're going to be having. Um, on September 22nd, we have a candidate's endorsement night. That's going to be at the San Rafael City Council uh, uh, Chambers in San Rafael. In October, we're going to have a reading of a book by one of our members, Lynn Bornstein. Uh, in November, after elections, we have our annual election wrap-up event, which is always very well attended. And then lastly, in December, we're going to have a holiday party. So it's going to be, you know, after the endorsement night, kind of fun after that. So hope you all can make it. Just uh, hope everybody's on our email list. Um, like to thank uh, Barbara Matas and uh, Ed Boris and their the program committee. And uh, that's about it for me. I don't want to take up too much time, as I said. Um, first on the list is, uh, on our agenda, is um, Pam Mindless. Mindless, thank you very much from Emerge. Welcome you, thank you. So thank you for coming. Uh, next on our agenda, Judy Arnold. Tales from the Battlefield. Judy just ran for uh, uh, my county supervisor, so she's fresh on her mind. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Yes, I did win. So that was good. <laughs> um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my campaign and if any of it relates to you as you're thinking of running for something, maybe, maybe it will help. My campaign really didn't have just one opponent. Um, it was about the Tea Party and property right act activists. It began 20 months before my election, and there were starting to be letters to the Nevada Advance that were very personal, personally insulting, and then a Facebook uh, ad campaign where they would ask questions and then say, why, Judy? And they were things that were really mostly lies. Like, for example, they said, Judy, you bought an SAP computer system that was $30 million fa failure. Why? Well, the Board of Supervisors neglect bought the, the L uh, SAP computer in 2003, and I didn't take office until 2007. So it, it, it just, things like that just kept going and going. The Journal of American Planning Association published a case study of the Bay Area and Atlanta, Georgia, and they wanted the, the Tea Party and the property rights advocates were very involved in. Um, the, the one Bay, the uh, Bay Area one was, of course, the One Bay Area Plan and the PBAs. The case study that, that the professor studied in Atlanta dealt with a, a property sales tax to bring in a, a, tr a transit system. The interesting, th and if you're interested in getting a copy of that, please, you can call my office. But the interesting thing about the Atlanta one was that it wasn't just the Tea Party and the property rights advocates that came out against Plan Bay, uh, the transit plan in Atlanta. It was the Sierra Club and the NAACP. So this movement um, is very real and is happening, and I think it's important that we recognize that. Um, and I mention this, this background information that I just told you about because um, 
I started out my campaign talking about what I'd done as an incumbent. And I brought my five copies of my five mail pieces there. And so I talked about what I'd done for traffic, what I'd done for budget and pensions, and what I'd done with a program called Vial of Life. Then we had phone bankers that were phoning, and we I had walk precincts, of course, and we did a phone banking five nights, uh, four nights a week, six six different volunteers every night. Some of you were there, and I thank you for that. Um, and then we began the phone banking began to tell us that um, this negativity and these these mistruths were 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 paying off. About that time that we started phone banking, my opponent did robocalls, and again, it was the same thing. It, it, it would say, uh, you know, did you, uh, I'm calling because did you know that Judy Arnold voted for a $300,000 transit system to go in just for, uh, to take a survey on why people don't ride the bus? Totally fabricated. And so, we decided we weren't going to do robocalls because people hate them. I got so many phone calls from people saying, I hate these. In retrospect, we should have done it, and I should have called myself and said, this is Judy Arnold, and what you just heard wasn't true, and here's the truth, and call me. But, you know, that's hindsight. Uh, now, my opponent was a, is a Democrat, and that's what I think really is important that we look at because her verbiage was vintage Tea Party. Uh, she used phrases like, no top-down policies. She started local organizations. She's one called Citizen Marin, which by its very name means that any refugee from Latin America probably isn't welcome at that organization. And uh, there were other little neighborhood organizations, which is all part of the strategy of this group. Um, and when asked, what she thought the biggest problem was facing the county, she said the dictatorship of California. <laughs> so um, her campaign manager was very conservative and was known for dirty tricks in Nevada. Uh, that's her campaign consultant, excuse me. Her campaign manager um, had been on the uh, Nevada school board and was very conservative. Uh, really fought against teaching, putting uh, sex education books in a school that says a family can be two mothers or two fathers. So here's what we learned, and here's what I'd like you to just be aware of. Um, if you're going to run for office, get a Facebook page and start taking ads on the Facebook page. This is once your campaign gets going. And you have to keep it up to date. Every day it would be nice if you had a picture, if you said, and Twitter, you need Twitter too. Uh, so you put ads on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, and if there are mail pieces that come against you that are filled with untruth, you, you need to answer them in mail. Now you'll see back here, I have three you know, very nice mailers about everything I've done. My last two mailers were where we just decided, no, we're gonna have to answer back. And so the one with the, with the police dog on it and the one with kind of the the cartoon man, those are the ones, you can take a look at that. Um, the phone banking, to, oh, all right, I mentioned that. We saw nationally in this June 3rd election that the Tea Party was very dominant in a lot of, of, uh, of campaigns. Like, you know, they even de defeated Republican Eric Cantor that they thought was too, um, was too liberal. So, I urge you to get, when you get started in a campaign, round up volunteers that would be willing to sign letters to the editor. Because if letters to the editor come about you, you've got to answer them. And you can't just let that lie there. So you line up people that will write letters to the editor, uh, that will keep your Facebook and Twitter up to date, that will help you raise money, walk precincts, and phone bank. All of that is very, is very important. We shouldn't allow the negativity where policy doesn't matter, but hurting the process is all that matters, and that's what this campaign was about. I think Marin deserves better. Daniel Moynihan said, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. So good luck. I do have to leave because we have a board meeting early tomorrow morning. Do you want me to take any questions or?
I don't usually do, but it's the question that I get asked most often is people want to know about fundraising. So there's four articles. They're not all about fundraising, and they're, both, they're all two-sided. Um, so the most important one, actually, is, is called What Voters Really Want to Know When They Ask Why Are You Running? So I'm going to start with two separate sacks here and two separate sacks here. Yeah, well, almost. And there's some on the back table, too, where Judy's stuff is. So you can go back there and get that. So the first question, uh, you'll be asked, why are you running? This is what every camp person that's uh, running for office gets asked. So who's the most important person in your campaign? It's not you, it's the voter. This is a little picture of a voter. You probably can't see it very well, but I'll pass it around. And it says, like, I usually do a PowerPoint, but we didn't have one for tonight. And it says, what can you do for me? That's what the voter wants to know. When they ask why are you running, they want to know what you can do for them. So be sure that you are able to articulate how your campaign will make a difference to that voter. And how, and then you have to know how you're going to get there, get elected so that that voter gets to vote for you. But before we go any farther, I want to see hands of everybody here that's actually running for something. And can you all introduce yourself and tell us what you're running for? We'll start over here with Evelyn. Evelyn Foster, and I'm running for the Marin Health District Board. Okay. Hey. I'm Christine Cunan, I'm running for the William Simpson School Board. This table? I'm running for the Health District Board as well. Okay. And someone else at this table? Oh, Liza? Lisa Cross, Lisa? running for the Marin District Board. Oh, David, I'm running for the San Mateo County Harbor District. So, you know, friends down in San Mateo. <laughs> 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 Was that it? Do you have more? Oh. Mike Vogel, we're in the Marin Healthcare District Board. Okay. So, we have three healthcare district candidates. We have a school board candidate, water board, and you're, uh, uh, she's an appointed incumbent. She has one challenger, I know, in the hospital board there are six of you, and you have four in your race with three seats? Correct. Okay, so, at, and there are incumbents in all of these races. We have one of them here. Any of the rest of you incumbents? Nobody's an incumbent, okay. Lisa, you're the only incumbent. And then Nicole has come all the way from Santa, um, San Mateo County. And she's running for the Harbor District there. So she's got the whole county of San Mateo, which is a very large district to run in, bigger than the healthcare district, which is probably the biggest district we have here that you're running in. So the, those of you who are running against incumbents are gonna wanna be able to say why they should vote for you and get rid of the incumbents. So that's something you have to think about, a way to articulate why you are the choice for the voter. So there are several components to campaigning. You need to have a strategy. You need to know how many votes you need to win. So you need to know how many vote voters there are in your district. And then you need to know how many are frequent voters. That is, how many of those voters are gonna vote in your district. And this is a list that just lists all the voters in Marin County from a few years ago for a, a, uh, a race that we did. And it gives, it's a real quick 
quickie snapshot. It says how many voters there are and how many households they live in. And they can get this. For and you can and you can get this. You can go to the county and you can get the list for thirty dollars or something. But it does not. It's not easy to use. So we buy these lists from a vendor. You can get that information. It's all online that I'm handing out. But if you want to get the list of uh, broken out for walking, for phoning, for mailing, you can get it from these vendors. It's, it's fairly inexpensive, and they and you just print it out on your computer as you need it, or you get it sent to your mail house for your mail to go out. So how are you going to get to these voters? Once you've identified, say you need 5,000 voters to win, and you can also look at the results from the last election, all that's online, uh, the County of Marin, or some of the towns have their own websites that have that. You need to know how you're going to get these voters to vote for you. So you're going to use a variety of methods. Uh, mail, we talked about, uh, Judy talked about mail, and we have some samples of mail, and um, Lisa is going to talk some more about the mail, because she's, she's the creative half of Green Dog Campaigns, which I should have said at the beginning, I'm Dottie Lemieux with Green Dog Campaigns, and this is Lee Stampley from Green Dog Campaigns. Um, we run a lot of campaigns in Marin and elsewhere. So we've got some samples of mail. We've got Barbara Heller's mail, which is one of my favorites that we did for her last re-election campaign. And we talked about how there had only ever been three women elected to the San Rafael City Council, and Barbara was one of them, and she, we had to keep her. So I'm going to hand these to Lise, and she can High five. pass them High five. Um, So you're also going to want a grassroots component to your campaign, uh, walking, phoning. You'll have to get those precinct lists get maps, stick them up on a wall, or have them in your computer, however you want to do it, and get volunteers who are going to go out and walk precincts for you with the list in their hand. It's going to look something like this, which is, this is really poor, a poor one. I couldn't find one, so I got it off the web. It's got the name of the voter, the address, the phone number, and it doesn't have a, all of it. This is from some county in some other state. That's support. Um, it should have what party they are, how many times they voted, their age, everything you need to know about that voter. And then whether they support you, they don't support you, they want a lawn sign, they'll volunteer, they're not home, whatever. Information about the voter, you can fill it in and then use that on election day to get out your vote. And uh, Steve Berto is going to come up and talk about how you do that in more detail. I'm just trying to get, I'm trying to get through this to get to fundraising. So you're going to use social media, as Judy talked about, Facebook, Twitter. You're going to want a nice website. And there are some uh, services that you can use to do websites, Nation Builder. Uh, democracy.com, uh, there's a few others, but even if you use a service, you want to have somebody that designs it because what they give you is kind of bare bones and it's not really distinctive. So you want to have a, a nicely designed website. We will talk a little bit more about that. And you want to think about whether, w with your campaign, whether you need to do electronic media like TV or, ad or uh, radio ads or even web ads. Uh, we usually do videos of our candidates and we put them on the, on the website and then we use them, uh, we link to them through web ads that we can put on newspapers or even TV stations, websites that people will go to and you can and then narrow down your focus down to the uh, zip codes that you want to reach. So even if you're going to the good, um, Channel 5 or Channel 4 big TV network, and you put a ad, web ad in there, it's going to just show up for the people who live in the zip codes that you want to see your ad. So it's not really very expensive and it's a good tool and it gets people to your website where they get more information. So you also want to do, keep a good database and send out email blasts to your volunteers and to people that you collected in your database so they know what your campaign is doing, when you're doing walking, when you're having parties, uh, what's happening, how excited you are, you've, raised, you've reached a goal or you have a dead fundraising deadline coming up and you need to raise $10,000 more by Friday. I think we all get those, right? Urgent, urgent, send $5 now and help. Usually it's Senate or somebody in Michigan or someplace. But we can use that too locally and it's very useful. As long as you have all the other stuff, I mean, you really need to have a whole integrated campaign because one of these components by themselves will, will not be enough. 
So when you do your messaging, your, um, I use Barbara's again. When you do your, your mail, say, or even what you're, what you're gonna say to the voter on the phone or at the door, you wanna tell them why they should vote for you, what, what you're gonna do for them, and why you're better than the other person. So we sent this to women only in um, San Rafael, and the message here was uh, there only have been three women, and then we had pictures and quotes of the other two women who had been on the city council, and Dottie Briner was, was one of them and a while back, and Joan Thayer was another one who was at the time our county assessor, so people knew who she was. And then inside, we have some more women, and we have a nice uh, picture of three generations. Uh, this is Bridget Moran. She runs the farmer's market, and her daughter and her daughter, and they're meeting Barbara at an event that the city council has on farmers market nights where you get to meet a city council member. So then on this side we gave the, the verbiage. She's been there for four terms. She's done a great job. She brought you this, this, and this. And in the next term she'll do this, this, and this. So she's done stuff. She's going to do stuff. Nice looking lady, has a nice picture. And then on the back um, we put a bunch of her endorsements and a couple of testimonials from other people who Lynn Wolsey and, and another fellow. So you just have to have a message and you want to be consistent with your message and with your look of your materials and make sure you're not saying one thing to the realtors and another thing to the environmentalists because they're going to find out that you've said a different thing. So make sure that you're saying pretty much the same thing and be succinct, use bullet points, use large type. The people who vote are generally the ones that are a little bit older. So you wanna use large type. Uh, make sure you're consistent, you're relevant, and you're graphically interesting. You wanna have material that stands out from the crowd so that they have a reason to open it. This was something for Diana Conti. We'll at least talk about ours. Um, who are the people you're gonna have in your campaign? You're gonna want a campaign consultant, maybe. Um, some campaigns, you're not gonna have a consultant, but most campaigns nowadays, you're gonna want somebody to work with like us there's, a, there's more consultants here. Steve Birdo is one, Paul Cohen in the back, he's another one. So you got a lot to choose from. Richard Folden Hour over there. <laughs> if you want any polls or anything, Richard's your man. So if you need a consultant to help you put this stuff together, do your mail, uh, help you with your messaging, help you find those voters, that's a, a good thing. But if you can't afford that, you want to have somebody help you. You want a campaign manager, some um, uh, volunteers. I mean, that's one of the, the most important thing you need is people to help you. And you need a treasurer. You need someone to keep track of your money coming in and going out and make sure that you meet those deadlines for the FPPC filings because you don't, you'll be in trouble. So make sure that you know all the rules in your district and make sure you know that you're meeting the deadlines and doing it correctly. And then you might want a kitchen cabinet, which is a group of people who know different issues that relate to your race. And those people will talk to you about um, transportation or the environment or uh, jobs or various issues, whatever they might be, that you don't have to know every single thing because you have trusted people you can go to. And then you need people to give you money. So to get any of this stuff, this mail, something to hand out at the door, um, all the things that you need to run your campaign, you're gonna need some money. So that brings us to fundraising. And you can hire a fundraiser. I think most of the smaller campaigns locally don't hire a fundraiser. But a fundraiser is not really gonna raise you the money. They're just gonna help you identify who has money and help you uh, plan your time for raising that money. So there are different ways to raise money. One of the first things you wanna do is send out a letter. This is a letter we did for Greg Brockbank in his last campaign, it's just simple one page, keep it to one page, use highlighting or bolding or something, make sure you ask for money and you put a remit envelope inside, which is, you probably are, have those and I don't have one, but um, yeah, here's one, one of these little things that you put inside so the money goes in there and they send it back. But that's not gonna get you money. The most important thing is a follow up. You need to call the people that you have, at, have sent this letter to and you need to say hi, after you've given them a few days, 
I called, I sent you a letter, did you get it? I hope you'll support my campaign. They might totally have forgotten if they ever got a letter. They might um, not even know who you are. So you might have to explain to them who you are, why you're running, kind of remind them what the letter says, and then ask them for money. That's the most important thing you can do is to actually make the ask. And the candidate herself has to be the one to do that. You can't delegate that task to anybody else except for certain things like um, fundraising events or maybe small donors. You can have people call in. At, you can chime in anytime. I'm saving her for all the beautiful artwork. <laughs> so when, you, when you're calling to ask for money, um, you want to set aside time every day to do this. You want to set aside, ideally, they say two hours a day. Every day. That sounds like a lot. But you're going to have to dig up people's phone books, uh, your phone numbers out of your book, or your, your phone, or wherever you keep your lists. You're going to have to know what you're going to say to the person. You have to know about the person. How much money can they afford to give? What do they care about? And then you want to have a sheet or some, something that you write on when you talk to them. And the best thing to do is to start with your friends and family. This is called the Circles of Benefit. It's, it's something put together by Emily's List. I think you've all heard of that, them. They're, they're a Democratic women's, used to be just fundraising, but now they do a lot of other campaigning for Democratic women. It's for early money. It stands <laughs> for early money is like yeast. Early money in a campaign, like yeast, makes the bread rise. We want our bread to rise? <laughs> we want our bread to rise? Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. Of course. Dough. It's called dough. <laughs> it's called dough for a reason. <laughs> so those of you who are candidates, you start with yourself. Can you put some money in your, in your campaign? And you put a little seed money in there to help yourself so that when you go to people, you can say, I've invested in myself. Will you invest in me? And then you go to your friends and your family, the people who know you the best, those people who will give to you just because they're your friend, you went to school with them, they're your Aunt Josephine in Michigan, they're somebody, alumni association. alumni association, your Christmas card list. So just dig up wherever you have lists of people that you consider personal relationships, people you work with. And then you go to the people who care about the issues that you care about. So if you're running for a seat that's um, involved with the environment, protecting the environment, you go to the envir uh, environmental groups, the Sierra Club, the Marine Conservation League, or their members. And you have to know which groups endorse and which don't. And someone's going to talk to us about endorsements later. But you can go to their members if they're not an endorsing organization. And talk to, find, and you find out who these people are in a variety of ways. You can go to their websites. You can talk to your friends about that belong to different organizations. You can also go to those FPPC reports that are filed by other candidates who have run either for the same race that you're running for or for a race that overlaps somehow with your race and see who gave them money. And then see if you know those people because technically you're not allowed to use those, those lists for fundraising, but you might have your memory jogged and you might think, oh, I know that person. Or, oh, they gave to that, that person, she can give me $500, she, she's only giving me $100. i am going to go back and ask her for more. So it's just a good way to find out who cares about the issues that you care about. And, and then you're you, never a loser when you fundraise. Right. You're yeah. never a loser. Let's say you've made this touch point. You've called someone. You've talked to them. Hopefully you do the art of the schmooze a little bit first. Hey, how are you? I got your name from so-and-so. Or do you remember when? What are you doing now? What do you care about? By the way, I'm running for this office. I really care deeply about this office. I've heard some things are happening in our community that I don't like. What do you think about those things that I just mentioned? Well, this is why I'm here. And I'm also here, by the way, to ask you for your support in whatever way you can, materially or just by your endorsement. But I really need the support of your financial help because with it, I can afford to mail and I can afford to reach those voters who, like yourself, want somebody in office that represents their interests. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm doing you, me, you, me, you, me. 
I'm making threads of connection in that conversation. It's going to open this up and hopefully let up the dollar tax. But if you get to the end of that conversation and it's a no, you've just gotten some gold. You've just gotten somebody to clarify what they're concerned about. If you, if you report on this, and after every conversation, you should report what you talked about, what was said, what you learned about someone else. This is going to help your messaging, but it's also going to mean that you have a memorialized count, account of that conversation. You can call that person again. You're still a winner. Even if you didn't get a dollar, you're still a winner. And, that, and if you think about yourself that way, it gives you the umph to go out and pick up the phone again and make the next call. You're always a winner when you call for fundraising. Very good. Thank you. So, so you need to get, have some connection with the person and talk to them. But it's also important to make the ask. You have to, at some point in that conversation, say, can you give me $500? Because you know that person can give you $500. Will you give me $500 to help this campaign get go forward? And then the next thing that you do is you shut up. You wait for them to answer next. It will get uncomfortable. But at some point, that person is going to say, uh, well, how about 250 And you'll say, thank you. That would be great. I really appreciate That's that. Wonderful. That's wonderful. That's <laughs> wonderful. And that'll happen more often than, than you expect. But you have, to know what their, you have to know what their level of commitment is, it can be, and then you have to make the, the ask very specifically. Or if you just say, can you give me some money, they'll say, well, I'll give you some $50. Have and a figure in mind. Uh, yeah, because otherwise you're going to, you could, you could just be really mad at yourself. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and what Lee said about keeping your good notes is very important because the other thing you're going to want to do is put these people into your database. Someone should be keeping a good database for you on a spreadsheet, like an Excel spreadsheet, of every person that you've contacted or met or is a volunteer or you want to contact. And then what their, did they give you money? Did they, did they come to your um, house party? Did they offer to have a house party for you? What are they doing? And then the, once it gave you money, you want to go back and ask them again. Because once they've invested in you, they will invest again. Because now you're, you're a, a cause for them. They want you to get elected. They're going to be annoyed if you're not. They're going to go back and they're going to help you as much as they can. So um, and it, it's always important to thank them. And also to get the money. Don't just let it end with a phone call. Make sure you pick up the money. Or if they said they're going to do it on your website, make sure that it goes through. And if it doesn't, have somebody go follow up with them, call them back and say, you, were, you pledged $500. Can I come and pick it up? Make sure you get it. And then write them a, a note. Have a, we can have a printed thank you notes, but put a little personal thing on there. And then put it in your database and, and keep moving on from there. Now the other way, another way to raise money is by events, house parties or big events where people pay um, cocktail parties or events at a fancy house that they're going to pay to go to see. But in order to do that, you really need to have com a commitment of a committee that's going to work on it. You need to have, you don't want to spend your time doing that because the return on investment in events is very small. Usually you don't make that much from events unless they're these big high ticket kind of events and someone's going to pay $500, $1,000 to come in the door. So anytime you have an event, try to get some high ticket sponsors, try to get some good names of people like Barbara Boxer or, or uh, Lynn, Wolsey. Lynn Wolsey or somebody that people know to, who's endorsing you to at least put their name uh, as a host, even if they're not giving you money. Um, they might be willing to do that for you, and then you've got that entree that might get some more people in the door. But make sure you have somebody else in charge that knows what they're doing and can keep track of a, a good event. So um, that's about all I have on fundraising, and unless there are questions on what I've said, I'm going to turn it over to Lise. Uh, Tammy? So one of the big questions that I always see is you put your own money in, you know, is it, is it 
better to put your own money in, or is you know it's better to fundraise? I've seen both sides. Where I see these. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll take that one, Go ahead. And, and then you can chime in. Um, sometimes we disagree. We're partners. <laughs> it happens. Uh, yes. Putting your own money into your campaign, especially early, signals that you're serious about yourself. It signals that you have the self-confidence and the presence to take a risk on yourself because you are essentially asking others to take a risk on you. I'm an image person and a design person and a message person and symbolism is important. In that one act, you've symbolized your self-confidence and your seriousness and your commitment. And because of that, you'll be taken seriously. Sound good? How'd I do? Yeah, that's okay. right. I would say that um, don't put too much in. Make sure you can afford it. Talk to your husband, wife, or significant other uh, before you start writing big checks to your campaign. And, and you call it a loan, and you hope to get it back, but you have to be ready to let it go. And here's, it all depends, too, on your strategy. Are you coming out early, or are you coming out late? We did a campaign recently where it was like a preemptive strike. The candidate didn't want to do a lot of fundraising, but he front-loaded with enough of his money that we could launch him with an updated website and some updated materials so that he was out there early, even before filing day. And he preemptively signaled to others that he was so serious about his campaign that they better launch a really effective campaign or they weren't gonna, weren't gonna be able to blow him out of his job, okay? So it can work. And in this case, front loading, say, this person also was very adverse to fundraising. So it worked for him. People are. Okay, and yes, a lot of people are. But we also had a fairly shy person who was very bureaucratic and very good with his job and very qualified for the job. And he believed in himself, and he blew the others out of the water. He received no challenges. It was money well spent, okay? And that would be another thing I'd want to say to you, is get out as early as you can with your campaign with a basic package of business cards, walk brochure, fundraising letter, remit envelope, okay? Website and Facebook. Your early website should have some attention spent to the design invested in. When you go out, you're gonna wear your nice clothes when you meet people, right? They're gonna be nicely designed clothes. They're not gonna have broken zippers or anything like that. Well, we want you to have a website that doesn't have broken zippers or anything like that. You know, the look has gotta be appropriate for you and for your message. Are you running on issues? Are you running on values? Are you running against somebody out of, they didn't do a good job, you've got to get, blow them out of the water? You know, what are you running on? Your, your, your website and all your materials need to message that symbolically in the choice of colors and in the choice of graphics. I've been teaching graphic design to students at two different universities for over 15 years, okay? So I've seen all the mistakes that young people make when they first come in as designers. And they're almost always confused about their hierarchy. They use either too many typefaces or typefaces that are all the same size. They use images that are blown out for highlight detail, don't provide context, and don't balance with the, the typography. Choosing a firm that has, a, has good design skills, good samples that work, is an asset to your campaign, and it's worth something, okay? Believe me, your nephew who just got out of the Art Academy may not be the best choice for a political campaign, okay? We had another question here. Let's yes. Get, and then we... I have a question, Dan, at the moment. So, uh, uh, the website smartvoter.org is from the League of Women Voters, and I was really surprised at the demographics. Everyone has a free web page, and this was created, you know, before web presence was important for a candidate. Right. But in the last election, only 40% of the candidates actually created a smart voter website, but it got 9,000 hits from here in 
So what do we learn from this? So we learn to make sure and you do your smart voter website smart voter. and that it links to your own website right. and that your Facebook page feeds people to your website and that you have a place on your website that can gather donations from people. It is very important in these smaller races because you can't get Act Blue or anything like that, but you can put a PayPal link in there, okay? That you do that and you drive people to it. You do an evite or an email invitation to a fundraiser, make sure you've got that front and center on your web page so, it, so it's, you're constantly refreshing that home page look, okay? Good designer can set you up with it, set you up with the tools and train you how to update it yourself, okay? And the question I had was, what's the average cost for a campaign, say for city council or a local it, race? It depends. It depends where, on where, where are you running? Are you well, running? I was thinking maybe some uh, either school district, city council, so something a little bit smaller yet compact. So not necessarily to go on the paperwork, but to drive. Well, um, each time you mail, it's going to cost you forty-five, forty-nine cents, right? Some, well, yeah. Right, so yeah, so you, you round, round it off to 50 cents, so reaching each voter by mail, it's going to cost that much. So start with some real hard numbers, frequent voters, Did you and if this? it's an off election year, look at off election year, okay? Right. But it helps to have a consultant take you through this too, because they can crunch the numbers even a little bit more for you, so that you're really reaching those who are most likely to turn up. Okay, and at the polls or absentee. And the thing is that, that all this online stuff is great and you have to have it, but you're not going to reach most of your voters that way. Most of your voters are going to reach through the mail or at the door. I mean, ideally, you'd knock on every door and you'd talk to every individual voter, but you probably can't do that in most races, especially hospital district. You're talking almost Much the whole bigger. county. Yeah. So if you're a small district like Christine is in, um, it's fairly small, <laughs> it's two, two small towns on the coast, um, she can maybe knock on a lot of doors with, she can with some volunteers. She can, she can do it. <laughs> Nicole in San, uh, San Mateo County, that's a huge county. That's really hard to knock on every door. She's not going to do that. <laughs> so you need so you need mail. You need things to hand out. These these are some things that we've used. You have to have something to put that they're going to get at their, at at their door, either under uh, under their mat or hanging on their door door knob. And uh, you have to hit them several times. You have to hit them three or four times at least. So with maybe three pieces of mail, maybe two pieces of mail and one piece that you hand them at the door if it's smaller. Um, signs, they're not that the most important, but most people want signs to pe put in people's yards. And we actually have a few more questions. I know that we're almost out of time. Yeah, so Nicole had a question. Here first, and then, and then yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering how you link your Facebook site to your website. You mentioned that, that you want to direct it back to your website. Well, you're going to create links to that track back to your website, website all the time. Like, let's say you make a post about a certain event coming up. Yeah, attend my event, you put the hypertext link right in your message. You know, as much of that as you can, I would make sure there are links in every single post that you create on your Facebook page. Yes? How do you suggest reaching out to you to unions that currently support the incumbent? That's not our question. I think we have somebody here who's going to take that question, right? What was Can I, I missed? It? How do you reach out to unions? To unions? Oh, yeah. yeah, we actually have somebody here who's going to talk about unions. Uh, and particularly. she's an expert, so, so we're I don't, we, if, you can, if you can stay to the endorsement part, you'll hear about that. Can you do that? Okay, that's yeah, because she is from the <laughs> North Bay Labor Council, so she's the best person to answer that question. Uh, yes, in the back. I was wondering, uh, no, you mentioned was when you get a donation to send a thank you letter. Yes. Yes, I thank did. You. I did say that. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It's the most noise. important thing you can say in a campaign. Even if someone's turned you down for money, the important thing you can say is thank you. You've given me thank some valuable time. information, and I appreciate your time today. I hope we can have a chance to talk again sometime soon. You know. Thank you for your donation. It means so much to me. And then let them in. Tell them something personal. This is what we did with your donation. We put it to keeping our website fresh and updated with new and exciting material about our, your campaign. We put it towards your mail. We put it towards this. We put it towards that. Every, your communications are connections. 
you need to mine all your connections together. Do I think Twitter is really important? I, I think tweets are important because they can provide areas for you to link back or talk about issues that are important. You can go on record about issues very briefly, of course. <laughs> But it also helps you drive more traffic to your website. But really, folks, most people don't look at the website. You know, most voters don't look at a website. Let's be specific about this. But I think the press does look at them. And we're going to hear from the press a little bit later. And maybe they, perhaps they can comment on that. And the consistency of your message across the board, if you have a uh, campaign um, a questionnaire that you've filled out for the realtors and it's different than the one, your answers are substantially different in the same areas or issues as the Sierra Club one, you better not get caught <laughs> dividing your issues, okay? Try to find, find your middle road where you're comfortable that tells the voter the most about you, but especially turn everything around every time and say what you're gonna do for them, what you're gonna do for them, what you're gonna do for them. Okay. Less about you, more about them. Yep, that? that little picture, that little guy, wherever he is. Okay. Is our, how's our time? I think, I think we're done. Yeah. Okay. I think well, she's saying, yeah. I'm going to pass out some of this material just for you to look at for examples. But we need it back because we're running, we, we end up giving away our stuff and we can't. So I'm just going to hand it. And did people get those articles that I passed out? There are some in the back here. Here. You know, you're going to want doctors and nurses on your endorsement list. That's going to be really important. You know, um, traditionally the candidates that have been successful at healthcare district have been those that have shown a great amount. 
now of people within the healthcare field supporting them. So those are other types of endorsements that you want to go after and um, just didn't want to leave it here without hearing that tonight. Um, other thing, shameless plug, and I hate them, but you know, guys, most of the time you're gonna to wanna to hire a consultant. And, and I don't say this because, you know, Dottie and Lees and, and the other consultants in the room, myself, are, are you know, looking to you know, get rich on this. We absolutely don't get rich on this. Um, at least we don't have my firm, I can verify that. Um, but you know, there are certain things that you, you don't know, you may not know you need help with. For instance, I have, I have a couple of candidates running in Emeryville for city council and um, they had the firefighters question they are due today. And one of the basic questions, um, which is a no brainer, let me just read it to you real quick, was, um, Will you oppose the closing of any fire company or fire station if it can be proven that it will increase that it will increase emergency response times beyond standards set by nationally accepted agencies? I mean that's a pretty that's a no-brainer question to begin with, but he was unaware of the lingo and he answered maybe. Now here's the thing that that people will tell you, right? They'll say, oh, that's not the right reason, that's not the right answer for this reason and that reason, and absolutely isn't the right answer, but that's what's called a qualifying question. And maybe Lisa will talk about this a little later, but you know, there are qualifying questions on candidate questionnaires where if you don't know the nuance, right? So a typical one is uh, we had another candidate running for supervisor who was asked, do you support uh, card check neutrality by a union? And that's basically the essence of that question is, do you support a worker's right to organize? That's, that's the basic question that any union's gonna ask you. Now, they didn't understand the term car check neutrality, and so they gave this really weird response that made it sound like they were. So when I, you know, as consultants, we don't write your responses for you, but you draft your questionnaires and then you give them to us and we say, oh, that may cause a red flag and I'd like to talk to you about your position on this. You know, um, I'm a progressive, so I have my own you know, per personal values that I like to, you know, bring into the fold, and I, I tend to be pretty plugged in on the political scene, so I like to advise our my candidates that way, and, and all the other consultants in the room are no different. You know, we, we take pride in what we do, and, um, you know, we want you to avoid those instances where if this guy didn't have us as his consultant or decided to go without a consultant, he wouldn't have got this endorsement, and he's a true progressive that he should have gotten just because he didn't understand the terminology. So there are things like that. There are things like helping you to understand when we talk about triaging the stakeholders in a community, knowing the issues. You know, we have our fingers on these pulses every day. So you know, it's just a just something to say. It doesn't have to be a consultant. Sometimes you could do it with somebody who's been in your community for a long, long time and is really tapped in. But to get those stakeholders involved is very, very important. Um, so that's it. So let's talk about field. And I, I really just want to focus on three basic issues of field. Um, I have about 15 minutes to do this, and I think we could get through it all and, and still have some time to take questions. But, um, you know, field typically refers to that part of the campaign that is dedicated to your in the field activities. So, you know, door knocking. Uh, vote candidate exposure, that kind of stuff. But you know, more recently, it's taken on this this more amorphous meaning of basically anything that has to do with voter contact. So, including phone banking and and other things now. So, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to discuss field as your complete voter contact strategy. Um, so, including phone banking and door knocking and all that other stuff. So the first thing you need to know is um, you need to understand your district. And I, I think Lee's and Dottie talked a little about, bit about this earlier, but you know, every district has a district profile. And right here I have the uh, Marin Healthcare District profile here. And so, um, I'm sorry, I almost saw Salida. This is Marin Healthcare District. So there are uh, 114,999 voters in the district. I should ask you guys first if you need that. <laughs> but anyways, um, so if you look at that, that's a lot of voters, and if you take you know, what Dottie and Lee's were saying, if you just want to send one mailer, which you shouldn't, the primary thrust of your campaign should not be just held in mail, but in this, this day and age, mail is a necessity, and you have to do it. If you're not sending mail, it, it, it,
it's almost saying that your campaign is not legitimate because all of the other candidates that are serious are going to send mail because that's the standard. That's the way it has to be done. So if they're getting three mailers or two mailers from candidate A and B, but they're not getting anything from you, that makes you look like you, you don't have enough money or your campaign's fledgling or, or whatever. So um, you have to do it. But you know, taking that, 114,000 voters at 50 cents a pop. It's a lot of money for healthcare district. Um, so you got you have to know your universe. 114,999 voters are not going to vote in this election. And when we talk about your field operation with your phone banks and your door to door and where do you as a candidate spend your time? You have to figure out who are the people that are going to vote in this election because those are the people that you most need to spend your time going after. So if you look at this, um, if we look at the voter history, look at the recent elections, we'll leave out uh, 2008, but uh, so 81,000 people voted in uh, November 2010, uh, 54,000 voted in the 2012 primary, 53,000 voted in the 2010 primary, so well short of the 114,000 that registered voters in the district, and it's a huge district. So, you know, you need to cut that down first. And again, this is where a consultant can be really helpful in terms of we know these, these numbers, we know how to cut them down, we know how to research voter history and, um, you know, historical election results and stuff like that to really base the formula of who is gonna vote in this. And then it's not always as easy as figuring, you know, what is the historical uh, turnout in these races in, in a given year, in a given cycle, but but it's also to think about what else is on the ballot that's going to increase or, or decrease turnout, for that matter. You know, is, it, is there a congressional race? When we look at last year, the, the June primary was much higher turnout than any other primary year in California, simply because we had a very contested congressional election on the ballot and we had a very contested assembly district on the ballot. Both campaigns were driving people that normally wouldn't vote to the poll. And when you're doing it on two districts, uh, districts that are that broad in scale, an assembly district that uh, covers Marin and Sonoma and a congressional district that goes all the way to the Oregon border, that's a lot of new voters coming to the polls. So you have to know what are the other mitigating factors that are going to increase or decrease turnout in addition to the, to the voter history. So that's the first thing you need to do is go through, filter down your list, develop your, your actual voting universe, um, because that's going to be the basis that you're working off of. Um, the other thing that you want to do while doing that is within your district, you want to identify the precincts. I, I do this two ways. You want to identify the precincts that have the highest number of voters, and you want to identify the precincts that have the highest turnout. Then you want to compare the two. All right, or, and you also want to go back in for those, I, I won't get into the whole tiering process, but you generally want to find, you want to spend your time in the precincts that have that are gonna yield the most votes for your campaign. So a lot of times, that'll be a, a, low, a low turnout precinct that just has a lot of voters, and then sometimes it'll be a very, a smaller precinct that has a ridiculously high turnout of voters. Generally, my sense is, depending on how big or small they are, you're gonna to wanna to go with the one with the higher percentage, but always let the numbers tell you that themselves or, or your consultant or whoever. Um, so that's really how you organize your field. The other part about organizing your field is your volunteer recruitment. And personally, in my experience running local races, particularly in Marin and Sonoma County, um, I think a lot of people always envision that they're going to have scores of volunteers on their campaign, but when it actually comes out, it's a handful of the same volunteers. And I think it's for a number of reasons. One of them is because our local elections generally don't generate that kind of excitement. It's not like you know Congress or the presidency that's on the news every night. You're hearing about it. You're hearing about who called who a jackass or whatever. You know, um, it, it's not like that. People just aren't in tune. If you don't read the IJ or the Pac Sun or really are plugged into local politics, you know, you're not gonna get excited about these local races, and I think that's a, a lot of it. But the other thing is, I, I think as stretched as candidates are, again, fundraising, endorsements, setting up your field, the one thing that candidates are, are lacking to do a lot of time is spend the time calling volunteers themselves. And so one thing that I require all of my 
candidates to do is in addition to making your five hours of fundraising calls a week, in addition to you know making your three hours of endorsement calls, I require them two hours a week of calling volunteers to get them to come out to a field mobilization or volunteer in some way. It doesn't have to be voter contact. They can help you stuff envelopes. They can help you you know get something up on your Facebook page, whatever it may be. You know, volunteer recruitment is the heart, particularly of a lot of these local campaigns where there isn't a lot of energy driven. So if you could really do a good job of getting volunteers out, going to spread the word to the likely voter households, that's going to be more effective than anything else. There's, you know, mail again is a necessity. Um, you know, newspaper endorsements are very, have a very, very, you know, strong message that they send. But research has shown there's no greater benefit in campaigning than person-to-person -person contact, particularly if it's you as the candidate, but even if it's one of your supporters talking to their neighbors. Personal contact it is an exchange of values. And that's something that you don't get through mail. You may get somebody's impression through a newspaper endorsement about values, but if you could hear it from your neighbor or the candidate themselves, there's nothing, nothing more important than that or more effective. And so that's why I do require my candidates to spend time calling volunteers, getting them out. I generally, for like a small, you know, the local city councils around here, I say if you have a core group of 20 volunteers that are gonna help you throughout the campaign, that's a damn good start. That is a damn good start. Um, so the other thing you want to do is you want to develop a database to track your volunteer engagement. So, you know, when somebody says they're going to volunteer, you put them in the database and say when, they're gonna, when they've opted to volunteer, what they prefer to do, because they'll tell you, I don't like making phone calls. I'd rather go and knock on doors, or I, I just don't like talking to voters. I'd like to help with your Facebook page. You know, mark that down so that you know, and, and when you talk to them the next time, you could say, hey, I know you expressed an interest in doing my Facebook page. Uh, so on and so forth. So, um, and then again, be very specific when you're talking with volunteers about the roles that you need them to play. You're not going to get anything, anyone to do anything for you if you don't ask. So, if you need somebody to help put up signs, ask about ask your volunteer network. If you need someone to help prep you for a candidate debate or just bounce some ideas off of, ask them. If it's door knocking, if it's phone banking, which those should be the ones that you most ask people to do, um, you know, certainly ask. You're not going to get anywhere if you don't ask. No matter how much you think people love you or how long they've been in your life, if you don't ask them, they may not know to do it. Um, the other thing is, uh, come back, come back. oh, so the other thing is early in a campaign, oh, candidates that are here, who has, who has already started going out and talking to voters? All right. Everybody's hand should be in the air because here's the deal. Earlier in the campaign, again, no more meaningful contact than person to person. That's, that's increased when it's in person and not over the phone. Now granted, you're going to hit way more people by phone calling them than you will by trudging from door to door to door, up the hill, down the hill, all around the bend. But the fact of the matter is, early on, you want to use those months to go out there and get that meaningful contact. And the greatest place to start is with your signatures in Lou. So you're going to have to, you need at least 20 signatures to get on the ballot. And granted, you should absolutely go and get those 20 people that you know that you want to support you to, to sign that. But afterwards, you should take that form out to people you don't know and use it as a reason to start the conversation. Again, that's something I require of all my candidates, is use the signature petition drive to, to start your field operation. Um, so then you're going to be using the, oh, I could be done too. So then you're going to use your, your field operation, you're going to do uh, door knocking early on in the campaign. So let's say, you know, uh, we're looking at November, August and September you should be on the doors. Late September you should transition to phone because again, you're going you're gonna to touch more people on the phone than you were to the doors. You could get about five contacts on the phone to one contact on the doors, all right? Um, so you're going to want to switch as you come into, you know, October, you know, switch to the phones, you're going to get more people. Also, the other thing you want to do early in the campaign is when we talk about organizing the field, focus on permanent absentee voters early and poll voters late. 
all right? So that whole month of September you should, you're going out, what I would do is I'd develop a list of solely PAU voters. Because we're gonna connect with everybody via mail, but most of these elections in Marin, particularly the local ones, they're done the second those absentee ballots come in. Not many, not many races are won at the polls these days, so aggressively attacking that, that PAV population early on is very, very important. Um, the final thing, uh, when it comes to, so after you re recruit your volunteers, you implement your field plan, you're gonna want a um, campaign walk piece, something that you can hand the voters, something that you, know, you show them. This is, I generally have a formula. What qualifies you on the front, your big endorsements, if you have a slogan or tagline, get your graphic identity up there, show your endorsements on the back, tell them what you're gonna do if elected and get a nice endorser. That's a, that's a simple formula. Put your contact information too. Let, make sure they're able to get a hold of you. But you wanna be able to hand this to people on the doors. You want it to look good per what Lee was saying. You know, this is the first impression a lot of times. So you want it to look good. You don't want, I mean, I've seen some really ugly stuff that, you know, just makes you cringe when you look at it. But, you know, make sure it looks good. Make sure it's your best, it's the best impression of yourself that you're putting forward. Um, the other thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you have, you know, you're set up. You do not want volunteers standing around doing nothing. These are people that are donating their time. Whether you're paying staff or it's a volunteer, you do not want people waiting around like, like you're unorganized and don't know what to do. Have refreshments ready for them. Have everything organized the night before. If you have eight precincts that you're walking in, you should have eight precinct packs ready with the list, the map, the rap, everything. Bring it to them. Do not let them stand around because they're going to be like, okay, I, I have two hours of my time. I've, I've used one of them just standing around, and now I'm going to talk to voters for a half an hour. And they, it doesn't make them feel like they've accomplished anything, and that, that uh, increases their chances of not coming back to help. So be prepared, you know, make sure everything's good. Again, this is something that a consultant helps you with, um, so, so it makes a lot of sense there. Um, and uh, the final thing, and, and this is very, very important, thank them, thank them. You have to, I, I say thank a volunteer at least three times, and then thank them again. Because again, these are people that are coming out because they believe in you. Um, Pizza goes a long way. Pizza goes a long way. I'll tell you just a really quick story. I went for office last year, and um, there was somebody who, uh, I know this guy from prior work with nonprofits in San Rafael, and he's very, very low income. And um, he came to one of my field mobilizations one day, and he said, yeah, I took the day off from work to come. And this guy, one day of work to him, is a considerable amount of income. And I was just blown away and you know, we had the field mobilization and everything and I, I thanked him and then I called him up that night and, and thanked him again and I remember just like t talking to my wife afterwards. I was like, Jesus, I was like, this guy just gave of his time like that because he believes in me, because we work together, we whatever, and he was, I was so touched. And, and you know, as somebody who's done campaigns for a long time, you, you're kind of surprised by those things that you know you see all the time, but it was very it was very meaningful to me, and it's, that's why I tell you, thank your volunteers at Nauseam. You can never thank them enough. Okay, thank you. Take any questions. <laughs> Okay, next on our agenda, getting those important endorsements. We have Jason Walsh, formerly Pac, uh, Pacific Sun editor, Brad Brighthouse, editor of Marin Independent Journal, and Lisa Moldonado, ex, uh, executive director of the North Bay Labor Council, and our own very own uh, Maureen DiDieva, um, Marin County Youth Democrats. So young Democrats. <laughs> okay. And I just want to plug your MWP's PAC's endorsement night. Remember, September 22nd. We're one of the few organizations where we have a very democratic process where our members actually vote. It's not just a small little group. This group on a, on a board of uh, an organization. So I just want to let have ten you know, so please come. And then also, okay. I'm going to start with Jason um, and Brad. Let your your um, supporters know they have to be members in order to vote by uh, 
uh, August 22nd or 23rd, 30 days in advance. So okay. please let your, your supporters know if they want to vote as members of our organization to get those um, membership dues in. I think uh, maybe Gina, you could let us know at the end, okay? All right, thank you. Um, so why don't we just uh, start with Brad? Is that okay? Oh, oh Jason, Jason, I'm sorry. We already you, you, it you guys are okay. Great, organized. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jason Walsh. Uh, I was the Pac Suns, the Pacific Suns editor uh, from 2006, just till recently. In March, I took a job at a magazine publishing company as managing editor. But um, uh, the Sun, I'm still a contributing writer, and uh, I'm still on the staff box for the Sun. And my email address is still open at the Sun, and I'm an advisor <laughs> for the editorial team. And I still do the heavy lifting for the endorsements because I've done these, I guess, the past seven years. And I've spoken at this event for four or five times now. And uh, uh, one of the things that uh, always happens is I, I talk about the Pacific Sun a little bit. I talk about, I guess, we've been around for 51 years, and our endorsements mean a lot. And I try to carry on sort of the uh, tradition the Sun's had and sort of its history of how it endorses the types of candidates and causes and. Uh, uh, issues it leans towards sometimes more than others, and um, it always ends up with there's a lot of questions at the end of the Q and A, which takes up a lot more time than me talking about myself. But uh, I always wish there's certain questions I always wish would, would be asked that are never asked, and I always think of these as I'm writing out the endorsements and the candidates have invariably failed to ask these questions. So I wrote some down, and this is completely self-serving. These aren't questions anybody would probably really ask, but I wish they would just once, just for me. <laughs> Should I bypass the press and run a grassroots campaign pledging not to seek endorsements or donations? Yes, <laughs> if you want to lose. <laughs> uh, the, press, the press is here to ask questions and to give opinions when in the endorsement process. And they may be dumb questions, they may be foolish endorsements, uh, but they serve a purpose and if you, if you give off the impression that you don't want to answer the questions or take part in that process, which is ultimately to inform voters, um, it, it's not going to do you any favors and it won't lead to any endorsement. Oh, the, uh, the endorsement process is starting, Jason. Um, and I know you might be sending me a questionnaire or calling me in for an in-person interview, um, but you're an investigative journalist. You find me, right? Well, I'll tell you, Nellie Bly wouldn't be able to find some Marin candidates sometimes. There's no email address, there's no phone number, there's no website, there's no Facebook page. There's a website, but there's no phone number, there's no email address. Definitely, definitely reach out to us, jwalsh at pacificsun.com, um, and then have these things available, like everyone said so far, Facebook page, campaign websites. Um, the, more, the more you make yourself known, the more your name is out there, the easier it is for us just to call you up and ask you questions. Um, hey, well, Jason, I do have a cam campaign website, uh, the press, and voters will go there for information. Um, I also have a personal Facebook page, but since I have that campaign website, you're certainly not gonna look at that, are you? No, no, we're not gonna look at that Facebook page. Because <laughs> you might have something embarrassing on there. And if it's a closed election, we might see a funny picture of you wearing funny things and doing funny uh, other things that might sway our opinion. So yeah, no, we're not gonna look at that. Um, here's one that I wish a, an assembly candidate a couple years ago had asked. Um, hey, it, it's okay if I bring my campaign manager into the in-person interview, right? <sighs> okay, let's well, see, your campaign manager is only in the interview either to answer questions for you, to keep you from saying stupid things, or to keep you from saying what you really think. Now, you can, your campaign manager can be in there and not say a word. We will leave with the impression that they're really worried that you might say stupid things, 
that you don't know the issues, or worse, you might say what you really think. Keep the campaign managers out of the interviews, please. And uh, here's one that comes up the most frequently, and I'll finish off with this before I actually do answer some real questions. Um, oh no, I take it back, this is not the last one. This is <laughs> the penultimate. You endorsed me the previous time I ran for office, so I can probably count on your endorsement again, right? Well, not so fast, candidate Spitzer. <laughs> Issues change and challengers improve and uh, lovers quarrel. And uh, don't phone in the endorsement date just because we came with you to the dance last time around. Um, here's one that uh, is my final fake question, but it's also a freak one. I had a terrible experience, Jason, with the planning commission when I was applying to add a 3,000 square foot extension to my Blythdale Canyon estate, should I run for city council on a platform of cleaning up city hall? Let me tell you a little secret, Mr. Blythdale Canyon estate. It's not all about you. Now, to be honest, a lot of people do run for personal reasons. Something stirred them to action. They had some experience that uh, caused them to start really considering for the first time that they wanted to maybe serve a little bit. But don't name that as your first and foremost reason to the press. Um, uh, actually, a pretty unimpeachable reason is like, I want to serve the community. Uh, we probably know that's BS. Yeah. <laughs> but it won't lose you any points. What you don't want to do is define yourself as the candidate who never considered cleaning up the stable until she stepped in the shit. <laughs> That's it for the fake questions that you no, you no longer have to ask. Well, so my for the real ones. <laughs> the appropriate role of the campaign manager is to help the candidate with his press releases to help you find him and his news. That is an excellent response. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes. Are there any other questions? Anything about newspapers? Anything about the campaign? Yes. Um, in this world of uh, tweets and people being so busy, we're encouraged to provide very short messages. But sometimes the issues are deep, technical, heavy on facts, regulatory, whatever. How deep do, do the press like to go in these issues? Uh, yeah, there's no such thing, at least if I'm receiving responses and I'm reading through people's responses or having an interview with somebody and they have a lot to say about it and they're very knowledgeable about it, um, don't worry, don't be too brief, don't be too brief. If the question calls for a detailed answer, we want that detailed answer. That's going to tell us that um, you know a lot about it and that you're at least, and you're willing to discuss it in as much detail and nuance as you can. I think short answers might be better for voters. I don't know. That's not where I come from. Yes. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. I have a question. Nobody else. Yes. Um, so, do, how much investigation do you do of candidates before they come sit in? I mean, I hope it's more. Oh, than I do a lot. Okay. So you check their donor list. Yeah, we check donor lists, and we talk to we talk to people about them. We talk to um, people that You're are on the involved. Facebook page. <laughs> you look for pictures of them in drunken, uh, you know. I mean, but do you do any like research about, for example, big donors, votes that for incumbents might have taken, for example? Not that I think of any particular candidate, Those assemblyman like Levine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Some of that stuff's easier than others. Um, in that assembly race, we were aware of, of that stuff. In smaller, in smaller races, like water districts, uh, healthcare districts, even it's not a small race, but it's not as high profile as even city councils. Um, yeah, the donor lists can sometimes have a red flag, but our re my research often goes to, I talk to our writers, I talk to people I know who live in the community who are, in, who are on top of it, and uh, talk to past, um, Perhaps people have served on the same board in the past that aren't really on the scene anymore. Maybe a retired councilman who uh, I've respected, uh, something like that. Get their opinion. Um, ultimately, uh, to be honest, when, when it, uh, the interviews are happening or we've often developed a bit of a lean in some directions and that's unavoidable. And sometimes you gotta come in there thinking, 
If he's even developed a lean, I'm gonna lean him back. And that happens too, that happens all the time. Thank you. Oh wait. How do you deal with messages that have been, by some people, deliberately confused? So for example, I'm opposed to X, which always seems to come out as I'm opposed to Y. Right? So X is a bad thing, Y is something that everyone recognizes as a good thing. How do you deal with that kind of, you know, and the people who are in favor of X often say, but it's the same as Y. And if you think about it for five minutes, it's not, but they say it is. So you get a situation where you say, I'm opposed to X, and what gets printed is, I'm opposed to Y. Well, my answer to that is um, be detailed if you're dealing with the media and make that look for those trouble spots and troubleshoot those um, by just making it very clear that either that's not the case or that is the case. Um, a lot of times people are opposed to things, but they don't offer up a better alternative. And I'm always way more impressed whether I like the alternative or not, at least you're kind of putting yourself forward and saying, well, I'm, I should replace this candidate because they uh, favored Plan Bay Area. Let's just say that, for example, because we haven't heard that one. And, um, <laughs> But a lot of times they don't come up with a better alternative, or they say, we could, we could discuss this more. You might be right, but I'd like to hear an alternative. And whether I think an alternative is as valid as what you're opposing, I like the creativity and I like the thoughtfulness. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brad Breithoff. I'm the editorial page editor at the IJ, and I've been doing is for about 10 to 12, 15 years. Um, so I've had a lot of uh, chances to meet a lot of candidates. Uh, and one of the reasons I accepted the invitation was because if you're running, you would generally get a call from me in the, over the next two weeks inviting you up to meet with the editorial board. And the edit IJ editorial board, which you can find on the top of the website or the, the uh, paper, is the uh, publisher, David Rounds, uh, our editor, Robert Sterling, myself, and we have a public member. Public member is always invited to attend the meeting, but they don't have a, uh, a vote in our endorsements. Um, and, uh, and we bring all the candidates in uh, to meet in sort of a round table discussion um, on the issues, starting out with who are you and why you're running, um, and I've heard the gambit of those. Uh, and then uh, uh, we have generally have some questions uh, that shouldn't, that most of which shouldn't come as any surprise to anybody who's been reading the IJ in terms of uh, knowing what, uh, what the issues that the editorial page and the, uh, our pages uh, focus on. But um, it's surprising how many people show up not prepared to answer those questions. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the meetings take about uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, we look for uh, not only somebody's opinion on the issues, but we look for their command of the facts and the issues. Um, and sometimes their misuse of facts and the issues. We also look at uh, the way they behave. Uh, we've had cases where I've had to put on a uh, striped shirt and a whistle and uh, tell candidates to uh, be a little bit more polite. I think uh, the, uh, the, ability, the, the, the sense that you wouldn't mind serving on a board with somebody uh, is, is important. Um, and there are people who come across that you really don't want to spend two and a half hours with that person and get out at a meeting at like 12, 10 uh, a.m. Uh, but all those factors come into play in terms of our, our making our endorsements. Um, we try to get the endorsements out before the uh, ballots go out, before voters get a chance to vote. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. I was overly optimistic two years ago 
uh, when we wound up interviewing uh, more than 100 candidates. And uh, there was just no way that we could interview that many candidates and get all those endorsements written. And uh, in fact, we were getting complaints for uh, all we were doing was issuing endorsements, which we were, because there was something like uh, 15 to 20 different races. Uh, our endorsement meetings are on the record and often a reporter will attend, the reporter usually covering that race, uh, and they will use uh, information and quotes from those meetings to uh, uh, for their stories. Uh, I'll also use them in the, uh, uh, in the editorial. Uh, for instance, when the court of three court Madeira incumbents come in and apologize profusely for having approved the Tamil Vista apartments, <laughs> I'm not going to blow that one away. That was, that's gold. Uh, but um, it's, it's an open process, and, and everybody who's been through it has, uh, um, has lived it to tell the tale. In fact, we've gotten um, uh, more thank you notes from people who didn't get the endorsement uh, than who did, uh, because they uh, appreciate the chance to have sort of a relaxed conversation of the issues. Um, in some cases, it's the only time that a candidate running for uh, the uh, uh, Nevada Fire District Board will have uh, a chance to talk about the issues because there's generally no like cry for a candidate's form for candidates for sewer district or fire district or even uh, school boards. PTAs are pretty good at putting on school board candidate sites, but uh, we've had cases where we're the first and only like face-to-face -face meeting of these candidates. Uh, the reason we uh, hold face-to-face uh, -face meetings uh, is it's a tradition, and it's a tradition of the IJ's respect for the fact that uh, you as candidates are taking time out to uh, put your name on the ballot and to seek election. And uh, uh, we think it's important that uh, uh, we meet with you in person rather than sending you out a, another questionnaire. because. I, I would guess there's about 10 questionnaires that candidates get. Um, and it also gives us a, uh, an idea of the candidate and how they present themselves as opposed to a questionnaire which has probably been uh, massaged by a campaign consultant. Uh, sorry. Uh, but it, it's a busy time for us, but we do think that our endorsements are important. Um, we're always asked why we still make endorsements because a lot of papers have, uh, some papers have decided not to, some papers decide not to make endorsements anymore and then turn around two years later and decide, okay, we were wrong, we're gonna make endorsements. Uh, we, uh, the editorial page takes a daily stance on local issues. A lot of those local issues are made by our local decision makers. Um, we feel that if we're going to uh, express an opinion about local issues and the, the uh, decisions made by those uh, elected representatives, we should uh, sort of uh, be involved in, uh, in expressing our opinion on those people who are making those decisions and whether they should be elected. Sometimes there will come out against an incumbent and sometimes we'll come out in favor of them. And a lot of times there's cases where we don't agree politically with, uh, with the candidate we endorse, but we feel that they are representative of the community and they're articulate and they, uh, they basically, uh, we feel comfortable that, that they're voting because they care about something, not because they're playing politics. So, any questions, yes? You ever not endorse a candidate for a race? Just flat out shoot. You mean uh, just take a pass in a just campaign? Yeah, it's probably the most difficult endorsement editorial I've ever written. Um, I mean, there are times when th there's a race in Muir Beach or Bolinas or Stinson Beach or Petaluma that I just feel really guilty about having somebody truck over the hill to, uh, <laughs> to come meet with us. And, there's probably not, we don't have that many readers who believe us anyway. Uh, the, the, uh, the one race I remember was a race for a district attorney 
between Paula Kamina and Posey. I forget Posey's first name. Yeah. And they were uh, they were so rude and obnoxious to one another <laughs> that our publisher at the time said we're not going to endorse either one of them. And we wrote the endorsement as a of the the editorial with a no endorsement. And I pleaded with her, telling her how difficult it was to write it. But she, uh, uh, the publisher has more votes than I do, and they have the editor. Um, and it's not very often I've had a publisher exert their uh, uh, or put their foot down on something, and she put her foot down real hard on, on that one. The other one we, we had difficulty coming up with an endorsement was the uh, Michael Allen, Mark Levine race. But we uh, eventually uh, endorsed uh, Mike Biden. And now in that race, the issue was if Marin County had a bill that it needed to get passed, who would have a better chance of getting this bill passed, Michael Allen and Mark Levine? And at the time, it was pretty easy to say Michael Allen, and that's what we based our endorsement on. Um, but there were reasons that we weren't impressed with either candidate, and that's why we were. Uh, it was a difficult decision. A lot of times you'll find that the difficult decisions are the ones, the editorials that show up at, at the end. Uh, for instance, when there was a race for assessor, Richard Benson against Shelley. Scott. 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 Excuse me? Scott. Shelley Scott. And uh, Benson's a hardcore bureaucrat, nice guy, but just really dull um, uh, technocrat. And Shelly was working in the office, and she's great, but she showed, she exuded no outward confidence or enthusiasm about being the assessor. And uh, we, you know, you got to show that you really want to be in, win the office that you uh, that you're seeking, not that you just want to beat the other guy. And. Uh, we, uh, we wrestled for that with that endorsement until I think about three days before the election. Thanks, Brad. Okay. Thank you. Lisa? Oh, patron? Oh, no, you, yes. Okay. Yes. Age before people. Uh, hi, I'm Lisa Maldonado. Um, you know, it's very interesting listening to everyone. It, I was brought back to almost before I went to law school, you know, all those trainings you go to where people tell you what it's going to be like. And uh, there was a time when I was trained to be on a suicide hotline and people tell you what it's going to be like and what can you expect. And um, I guess before you lose your virginity, right, people tell you what it's going to be like. <laughs> this need to find out what's the actual experience going to be by a bunch of people who really don't know. They have a piece of it, right? But they don't, you're not gonna know until you do it, until you run. And for all that, I think people gave some really good advice and have given great advice here. You need to keep your, true to yourself, I mean, and, and your gut instinct as a person and why you're running for office. I'm one of those people that, um, my politics is driven by issues. Mainly right now, I mean a lot of issues, but mainly right now it's about the working class, working people, rebuilding the middle class. And I think of myself, those are the issues that concern me. Inequalities, income inequalities, uh, people having health care, families being able to have good jobs and not have to, people not having to work two or three jobs and not see their kids. You know, kids who don't have to worry that they won't have a place to live in, kids who know that their parents have a good job, pensions, an ability to retire in dignity. That's what gets me in. So the kind of current political discourse, which is very high school election, I want to be popular, I want everybody to like me, that kind of, ugh, I don't like it. You know, I, I get that that's how people, some people do politics. I get that some people think it's all about, you know, chasing every single vote. Um, but I tend to look for, in politicians, people who are really leaders, uh, people who, can say the right thing and don't have to do this and don't have to run out of focus group because I think you need to be smart enough to find an issue and then frame the issue for different, you can certainly frame the issue for different people, but the principles stay the same. And for us in the labor movement, especially because labor and unions have constantly and consistently been so attacked, we need strong people and we look for strong people. We don't want the milk toast, middle of the road, person who can't say the word union. We don't want 
the person who's afraid to stand up and say, I support working people's right to collectively bargain. I'm proud to have the support of a union. I believe in collective bargaining. I believe in democracy in the workplace. I believe that every person, no, no one should, you know, work 30 years and then have to get their health care at an emergency room because they didn't have a pension and they don't have good health care. So I, if you, we have a threshold, right? And, and certainly like everybody in politics, there's been, sometimes you gotta go for the bottom of the barrel, you gotta go with what you got. Not every candidate meets it. But I think we've been pretty lucky out here, especially because I think that this is a very progressive area. I think people here, um, you know, especially Marin, I used, to, I used to work for the ACLU, I worked with, um, uh, actually Paul Cohen's mom was one of our, um, AC, local ACLU <laughs> chapter people. And uh, I, I always wanted to retire in Marin because I thought this is where like, all the old radicals go and they're still organizing at their senior center and fighting for the rights and telling the people in their senior center, you work too hard, you should, you should have better health care. And um, that's the kind of person Marin was, that's the kind of people I think of as Marin, but I think that like a lot of current politics, that's changing. And you're getting some people that are much more me, I got mine, screw everybody else, keep everybody out of here. And I think that for political leaders, for any kind of leaders, we need people who can stand up to those folks with a great vision of our country and our community and bring back everybody. So um, I like working with people like Dottie and, and Steve and, and uh, Paul because I, I think that they bring that to their, they're not just the usual, I mean, I don't say the usual political hacks because, but they're, they care about issues too. People in politics, if you don't care about issues, I kind of feel like, who are you? What are you doing in politics? If you don't want to change things, make things better, then you're really all about, you know, it's a popularity contest or, who is it the comic says it's uh, it's like Hollywood for unattractive people. It's like what's the what, what's the point, right? You know, with all the jockeying and who's on what commission, who's going to get this. I would much rather spend time with a, a raving ideologue who disagrees with me than a phony like Tony Schroyer, right? Who stood up there, told everybody a bunch of bullshit in her little suit, and she was lying the whole time, um, and she contradicted herself. And she was bringing a Tea Party agenda under a Democratic, as a Democratic candidate, and her consultants were more of the same. And they pandered to the worst elements of racism and xenophobia, and a bunch of people sat and let them do it, and we almost lost one of the best people we had because people were afraid to speak up. And you know, some of that's more in culture, right? People here are a lot different than Sonoma. People will be a little bit more in your face, but here I think people do have the zeal to appear well-bred at all times, and so they tend to <laughs> think fighting is beneath them and disagreement is beneath them. And uh, you know, so I, I want to caution you: if you want the support of labor, we look for fighters. We look for people that are not afraid of conflict because they will attack you. They will say, "Oh, you're in bed with the they have pensions and the public." If you can't. Uh, answer those questions in terms of being proud to have labor support, don't bother. Because, you know, we have enough on our hands without having to prop up candidates. Now, that's not to say that we agree on every issue and we expect every candidate to agree with us on every issue. We don't. I mean, Shirley Zane, who was a supervisor that um, Dottie and um, Lisa did a great job with her campaign. And Shirley was for first time running, very interesting person if you've never met her, and as a woman, almost like a test case for the stuff that women have to deal with, right? The obsession with how short her skirts were, or her cleavage, or, or her hair, or too much makeup. But I remember, you know, we had a big difference over the casino, right? The great casino which was being built union, and Shirley, who came from uh, Health and Human Services, and also I think had been a chaplain, and her seniors, and we would get a big argument, and I'd tell her, Shirley, what are you talking about? Gambling isn't right, Lisa, it's not good for seniors. The stock market is gambling, Shirley. It's done worse, worse, scam, worse has been done to our economy. Our economy has been destroyed by the stock market than by gambling. Why shouldn't poor people have a right to gamble the way rich people have a right to gamble? Um, and so what we came upon was, it's fine if you want to say you oppose the casino or you, don't, you oppose gambling. If you want to talk about the environmental issues, talk about the environmental issues. But what we would ask you to say is, any developer, the one thing that the great in casino is doing it right is having car check for union members, paying good, decent wages, health care, offering health care for their employees. I wish all developments had that same kind of built-in agreement. There's a way that you can agree with the principles of labor and still disagree on a specific issue, and surely managed to do that. Um, and I, I think that 
Steve touched a little bit on this with the questionnaire, right, where you have a, a series of questions. Most of what we want to know is that you agree with the principles of collective bargaining and, and unionism, that you have some knowledge of it, that you believe, I mean, baseline, right, that you believe working people have a right to participate in politics, have a right to have their voices known in politics. And, and have a right, just as much of a right as real estate interests. I mean, this is my, my personal quibble with the Press Democrat and other papers where they, they, they always describe a candidate as labor-backed candidate, right? But you'll never see Chamber of Commerce, Business, Real Estate Development-backed candidate. The only people that are held to not be um, appropriate for us to be in politics is union and working people. Supposedly that's bad, but if developers and real estate people want to do it, that's their natural prerogative. Of course they should play in politics. So um, in terms of, I know one person asked a specific question about unions, and I, I, there's so, you know, unions are, it's a vast world. I grew up in a union household. My dad um, came here from Mexico picking cotton, strawberries, and uh, he had a third grade education. When he got here, my grandpa helped get him into the laborers' union. My grandpa had been in the general strike. He was a cement mason. He organized mushroom packers. And um, when my dad got into the union, that changed our family's life. I mean, we were able to have health care. We went to Kaiser, I remember, the first time when I was eight. We got, you know, we were able to buy a house. My brother and I went to college. The unions brought the middle class to our family. You know, and again, my mother was a teacher, so she was also a union. She was a strong union person. She was her steward. She was, you know, very involved in California Teachers Association. And I saw that benefit of bringing people into the middle class, people who historically would never have made the amount of money that my, my and it wasn't a ton of money, my dad was a teamster, he ended up being a truck driver, he didn't make a ton of money, but he, he had health care and he had some other, uh, he was able to save, he didn't have to work, you know, day labor or jobs without, that they had no future. And he also had protection, because he told me when he used to be a farm worker how, you know, they'd call the immigration on them as soon as they had picked all the crops so that they didn't have, and then take them all away. And he always told me this one story, this, uh, this one guy, this one immigration officer, who marched all of them up to the, to the farmer, said, okay, I'm gonna take these guys, but you better pay them all first. You pay them what you owe them first. And that was once, I mean, he was thrilled about it. That was once, that happened once. So I feel like I have a duty to kind of evangelize about unions and unionism, and I try to do that. It's not to say I don't see the warts, and I know that there's hard questions about unions and difficulties, our job at the Labor Council with our candidates, actually with anybody who's interested, is to help people navigate these questions, help people be able to talk about pensions. Um, right now, the right wing has kind of grabbed the um, uh, unfunded viability bullshit, and that narrative keeps spinning it out, right? But there are arguments, and up here especially, the majority of people support um, you know, unions, workers standing together, collective bargaining. So um, I, I want to let people know that you know you should definitely contact us. I'll leave my card here. I'm, I'm easily accessible on Facebook, as is the Labor Council. Um, there was a specific question. Yeah. Um, one. Really have to I'm sorry. I talked too long. I want to just let him have his question. He waited a long time. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. So as the CEO and President of Pat, so I'd actually negotiate with Local But my question is, so it's not like attacking either way. It's really how do you reach out to the unions that are already supporting the incumbent to try to direct that support to a new candidate? You should always introduce yourself, and they should always allow you to, they should always return your call, and at the very least, set up a meeting with you to interview you. That's, you know, unions are individual, and they have a great degree of autonomy, so not everybody does everything the same way. Some unions just meet with a person for lunch, and, and that's how they decide who the person has the best, if that person has what they think is good labor credentials. And others subject you to a questionnaire and a rigorous process and then they vote on it. It depends on the individual union. But I would be happy to sit down with you. If you're in the port, like I, I want the woman in the San Mateo, you know, you need to talk to the, the ILWU, you need to talk to the Teamsters. There's specific unions. If you're in the hospital district, obviously you want to go for the nurses and the doctors, but you also want to go for NUHW or SEIU UHW, which has the majority of healthcare workers there. You will probably have Teamsters at your hospital. The Teamsters are, are big players in the hospital district. I know they're interested in that race. Um, so you, there's a whole bunch of unions that you may not know about. Just the, the top ones might come to mind, but there are a lot of other unions. And you know, the union movement, they tell you it's like a family. What they don't tell you, it's, it's kind of like the, 
<laughs> like the Manson family. No, like the. Um, <laughs> so, so I will be happy to spread information. And talk to you later after, afterwards. More questions afterwards. I want to continue. Sorry. No. Go ahead, girlfriend. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> And I'm like, look at it. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Hi, good evening. My name is Maureen Denieva. I go by the nickname Mo. Um, I wear many hats in the county, but um, the most proud is that I am the secretary of Marin Women's Political Action Committee. I'm also the secretary of Marin County Young Democrats, which I'm representing tonight. But more recently, I was appointed by unanimous vote by the Board of Supervisors to be the at-large representative on the Marin Women's Commission. And that in itself just goes to show that anybody can run for office. Boards, commissions, um, putting your hat in an elected race, that's the ultimate form of volunteerism. So I want to say kudos to all the men and women who came tonight, because even if, say, you don't win your race, that is the first step of visibility. So the next time you can run, or maybe you might try for something that's lower hanging fruit and really develop that in a board or commission in your community. Um, Tonight, we've talked about a lot of different things and issues, but the baseline is, what are you committed to? You ran all for a reason. And so tonight, with our segment about endorsements, we, as representatives of either the press, or a union, or a partisan organization like the Marin County Young Democrats, we're asking the candidates, what are you committed to? Literally, like, Lisa said, we're cutting the BS. I can't swear, <laughs> but we're cutting the BS. And so, um, although most of you are running for nonpartisan seats, tonight I'm speaking from the perspective of a partisan organization. Marin County Young Democrats is a group of young Democrats who are eight, between the ages of 18 to 35, dedicated to democratic values. In our mission statement, for specifically Marin, we recognize that 60% of the people who work in Marin can't even afford to live here, and they commute. So specifically for diversity and inclusion, we put in our mission statement, our values that every member is someone that works, lives, or goes to school here in Marin. When you're seeking an endorsement from an, um, an organization or the press, make sure you know what their values are. You know, you don't have to be everywhere at every point in time. If you're stronger with Facebook, if you're stronger with, um, you know, Instagram, go with that. Um, if you have, you know, what's realistic to you. This is how our endorsement process works. We are an organization that started in 2008 and we've had many waves of leadership. We're in our third iteration. But what's exciting about our group today is that we're always evolving based on what's going on with the democratic platform. Our system is this. Yes, you can come to us, but we actively look on the list, which is different. Someone said about the um, candidates, it's really difficult to look up in a nonpartisan race, <laughs> do our research about who's a Democrat and who's not. So if you are, feel free to reach to us out directly. It would, it would help us. But you know, we reach out to candidates and we say, hey, we're this organization. We endorse Democratic candidates. You know, we would like to invite you to be part of our endorsement process. And this is how it works. Leading up, usually, if it's a November election in the month of September, we will give you a two-week turnaround time for a, um, a questionnaire. Now, this questionnaire is different from a lot of other groups, but this is how we based our questionnaire. We looked at the values of the Democratic Party, specifically the California Democratic Party, and we based our questions in a box. And if you email directly, I'll be happy to walk you through that process. And uh, but. It's check boxes, and as Steve talked about, these questions aren't necessarily about how you feel about charter schools, etc. It's do your values, the way you vote, the things that you're committed to, do they align with the values of the Democratic Party, who we are trying to represent as young Democrats? And that's the core issue. You know, for us, the second part of the process is that after you give your questionnaire to us, we send that question out to our entire membership, and they are required to read it word for word. And for those candidates, there are some in the past who felt that their intern could cut and paste their answers from other endorsement questionnaires, or they could just provide bullets. We aren't stupid. 
We are just like you. We voted and registered to vote at the age of 18 because we were committed to making sure people, people like us who held our values were in the offices that, that are around us. So please consider our vote just the same as anybody else's. So we read those for sure. Grammatic errors, we will take into consideration, absolutely, because it shows that you invested time in our organization and our endorsement. Now, if you don't have a Facebook, we're not gonna hold that against you. But if you have a website, you have to make sure whatever is out there visibly um, is, is really true to what you're speaking to and make sure that things are updated consistently. Uh, the other thing is with our endorsement process is that once you're called into an interview, the interview lasts 15 minutes. We will not ask any questions that we've already asked of you in these endorsement questionnaires. This time is simply for us and our members to ask openly furthering detail, things that you, wouldn't, you didn't capture in your um, endorsement itself. So that's pretty much how it works for us. Now the other question is when you're asking for an endorsement is what's in it for you? That's the selfish moment. What can this organization provide for you? Some organizations can provide a monetary donation to your campaign. And some, like ours, is more about the time, talent, and treasure. We do not give monetary donations, but we give you people power. So if you get an endorsement from the Marin County Young Democrats, you're getting our access to our Twitter account, to our Facebook page, to our website. You get a dedicated phone banking day from us or a dedicated campaign walking day from us. And so that's what we can offer to you. So when you're spending time trying to figure out which organization am I going to get an endorsement from, make sure you're getting also a bang from your buck from putting your time into it as well. The last piece that I want to say before I open the floor to questions um, is that it's all about your heart. You know, you're putting yourself into this um, election cycle, but yes, we are young Democrats, so do your research about what issues m are meaningful to us. In Marin, it's definitely about affordable housing, health care, absolutely. How does the Affordable Care Act, how does that affect us? You know, I pride myself knowing that I can live and work in Marin, but barely can make it, and my goal is to make Marin my home. But we don't want to be pushed out. We're not as lucky as other folks. So if you can speak to us about our issues, we'll be able to support you, even if it is the Bolina School District. <laughs> Education does matter to us. And even though some of our members might only be from San Rafael, if you're someone that we believe in, we'll track to where your race needs the most help. Now, before I go into questions, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge today being the 94th anniversary of the 19th Amendment being ratified today, allowing women the right to vote. I know. Come on, come on. Yes. When you have a face-to-face -face conversation, I actually talked about this at work today, my title does not describe who I am. Neither will your title if you are elected to office. If you have only 15 seconds to make an impression on someone, just start with this. Hi, my name is Mo, and I'm committed to blank. So today, I will tell you, my name is Mo, and I'm committed to making sure women run for office and not for coffee. Women of color make sure that they know they can be advocates in their community. And all women, no matter what, can be a part of the leadership process here in Marin. Now, my question to all of you is, what are you committed to? <laughs> at this time. <laughs> yes? Can we vote for you? <laughs> <laughs> not yet. I gotta get my, someone asked me that and I said no. Now is not my time. How it works for me is making sure other people are elected who hold my same values. That way later on when I run, to be honest, it'll be easier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Um, what is your name and what is your question? That was my question. Oh, that was your question. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? <laughs> Any questions about social media at all? I do a lot of social media work too for my job and for the Democratic Party, but yes? Really, how many of the voters actually use social media? You know what, it, it, it varies and depends. And I'm going to actually speak upon my personal research um, doing uh, social media work specifically. It, it depends on your demographic. 
So Steve talked about, everybody talked about voting lists and who your voting demographic is. Most permanent absentee ballot voters are basically the, the Marin County um, voting population is an aging Marin. So we can't necessarily assume that all of them have a Facebook account. So more so your energy should be door to doors or gaining volunteer base to do door to doors for you. Um, in terms of social media, paid ads, I know someone talked about it, is your bang for your buck. So if you don't have a Facebook page, or, but you have a, a website, what you can do is invest in a Facebook ad or something that's more popular to read nowadays in social media is the Patch Community Online Networks. And if you haven't heard about the Patch, what it is, it's an online newsletter format where members of your community also have an editor, but they do direct news. So you can do online ads with the IJ, you can do ads with the Patch as well as Facebook. But I really reached to Facebook because if you're running a grassroots campaign, which it sounds like most of you are, you can control the messaging, you can control your budget. You can do it for as little as $5 a day or 10 cents per click. And what I would suggest is making sure that your ads rotate and when you click on the ad, it, it'll connect to something, whether it be your personal Twitter account or you know your Facebook page or your website. Because for, at least for people who are on Facebook, they wanna make sure they're going to somewhere. And if it's your personal Facebook page, they'll like you right there, then and there instantaneously. Also about that with paid ads is that you can control your demographic. You know, before I did paid ads for our organization, we were getting likes and clicks and visibility from like Nicaragua and like other things. But you can control, I only want it in 94901. I only want it within 10 mile radius. I only want men and women within this voting uh, bracket or age bracket. Mm -hmm. But a really good question. Yes. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Overall yeah, sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Just a quick one. What do you think in terms of timing from your experience for the Facebook ads? September, October, or earlier than that? Or? So, when did you file your paperwork? Before August 8th. So, that's when you start with Facebook ads? Then? Pretty much instantaneously, if not prior, to get your visibility out. It's online messaging and media, and then everybody can ask a question, is only an extension of your on the ground work. Do not count on social media to get this volunteer base or get these crowdsourcing dollar amounts. Those are really rare occurrences. What you really need to know is your message and that you can use this as a tool to spread out your message on a smaller budget. But really, it's the power of the people in your room and that circle of influence and circle of benefit that the previous speakers were talking about. But I just want to say the thing about Facebook and Twitter, and if you do have your own page and you use it to boost ads, you can tell a lot about yourself for volunteers without having to craft a, you know, a, a, a message. Like mm -hmm. if I see someone who's tweeting and they send a copy of, a, they're attached a really good article from the New Yorker. That tells me something about mm -hmm. someone, right? I'm gonna, so, there's a lot of voters that are gonna go, oh yeah, okay, that's, you know, they'll remember that. You don't, every tweet doesn't have to be, you know, a brilliant whatever. Sometimes you're just putting ideas out there, things that you might agree with, things that might, uh, that you think are good ideas, but they also capture, uh, the, you can watch on Facebook, when you boost an ad, it's amazing the kind of, um, you know, you can get 9,000 people, I mean, just like that in a day, very quickly. And they, like, uh, like Mo was saying, it's your exact demographic. You can choose women 60 to 80 in this zip code, and that's the only people that you'll end up paying for. So it's really, it's worth it. Or did you hear this national study on income right. inequality? Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, I thought this was a good read. It may be from the New York Times or the LA Times, but it tells people where you're thinking. Right. Mm -hmm. It shows. It tells about you. It, it builds context for you as a candidate, you know, without you having to kind of be grilled or be specific, um, which can be hard in those little tiny increments. It also humanizes you. You know, I've seen political candidates. They take advantage of what's popular. So, for example, um, Woman Crush Wednesday, and they post a photo or an article of someone that they admire, admire, or Feminist Female Friday. Um, you know, these are things that you should should know of. You could do a quick Google search about it. But my favorite is definitely um, Throwback Thursday. I know a candidate out of Sonoma County. He's been a long-standing person in his community, and he threw back photos. Actually, someone who is the perfect example is Representative John Ding out of the um, uh, 
Congress, follow him on Twitter and follow his Facebook page. He does an excellent job with his staff of making sure that you know that he's been around and he's experienced, but he adds humor and vulnerability in his pieces. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how much penetration do these papers actually have at this point? Penetration? Well, um, the Pacific Sun's uh, circulation is about 22,000, and then penetration, there's a formula that they calculate yeah. for that, and it, it turns out to be about 75,000 eyes. Um, now that's... Is that, that's, 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 that's the eyes? That's the eyes. One eye at a time. One eye <laughs> and uh, that's just for print. I'm not sure what the numbers are these days for our... Facebook and Twitter and uh, the website. You might on the other. Uh, actually, I, I miss. I just got back from vacation, so I missed the uh, our our meeting about circulation. But our our, uh, our circulation is about uh, thirty to thirty-five thousand uh, daily. Uh, the uh, our circulation is larger on uh, on Sundays, and uh, our uh, circ our. Clicks, I guess, on the uh, on our website are uh, I, I don't have a number, but it's um, it's a pretty impressive uh, number. We're sort of the the go-to place for uh, for news in, in Marin County for daily news, and uh, okay. I would imagine just what what just happened, you know, uh, Robin Williams' death probably uh, sent our numbers uh, uh, pretty high. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much.